let me give you a brief overview of the common the contents. I'll start with um, the overview of the Legal Aid Center so that you can know what I'm going to speak about. And then I'll speak about what do states do normally to achieve the MDG goal that we are discussing about. And I'll point at a missing element, that's access to justice aspect. And then I'll give you an overview of major cases that we are handling in the Legal Aid Center and I'll show you the photo gallery and I will try to show you how we can change lives without requiring budgets. Uh, our, legal, uh, our university, Gondar is located in the northwestern part of Ethiopia, some 700 kilometers away from Addis. 700 kilometers. In fact, 738 kilometers, to be very specific. So, uh, in our university, we have a law school, and I'm a lecturer there, and the law school has a community service wing. The community service wing is the legal aid center, which provides free legal aid to indigent clients. It was established in December 2009, before the new CSO legislation was put in place in Ethiopia. But when the new CSO legislation came into action, a number of universities in Ethiopia were forced to close down their free legal aid service programs, but ours was sustained. And it rendered the first professional service for a woman named Lem Lem Berhe, and the case was a maintenance issue. And now it has 13 branch offices within 100 kilometer radius from the town of Gondar, uh, and in seven districts. And by now it has 20 staff, 24 part-time self-giving instructors, and more than 70 student volunteers. And the major objective of the center is accessing justice to the needy and ensuring that rights are being protected. I know that we are living in, in, in a country where human rights is not being respected, so we have to work hard. And the other aim that we have is ensuring clinical legal education. And in fact, it's the second objective that we are using as a justification to convince the university management so that they can give us funds, the lead funds that we are using for accessing justice to the needy. If we say that we are going to do it just for promoting the right to access to justice, nobody would give us an ear. But when we say that this is a clinical program, so we have to train our students accordingly. So everyone, somehow, at least, will not give us no for an answer. Uh, let me give you what my target beneficiaries. Indigents who are unable to access paid legal counsel. And our special emphasis too is to the vulnerabilities included here. Women, children, the elderly, persons living with disability, persons living with HIV and AIDS, and prisoners. The major service we give we provide basic courtroom information. We mediate and settle cases in an out-of-court arrangement. We prepare various pleadings. We represent clients in courtrooms through our licensed professionals, including myself. Miscellaneous services, including serving summons, sometimes for someone who, who has a, com I mean, who is having a legal case, even serving a summon is not an easy affair. And we use the media to educate the public as well. When I say the media, I'm talking about a local FM radio that our university owns. Our motto is, we are the voice of the voiceless. The other one is the Amharic script. Um, and what do states do to achieve the MDG goal? This is normally what states often do. They enact laws so that they can achieve gender equality and women empowerment. For instance, Ethiopia has, has enacted uh, and, in fact, revised the family court, enacted a new criminal court, enacted land laws, and many other laws. All these laws are geared toward this, ensuring that gender equality is achieved and women are empowered. So we are having a number of laws in place. And then they repeal laws. There are a number of laws repealed, including the 1960 Civil Code of Ethiopia and 
and many other and many other laws which are told to be income I mean inappropriate in this context because they are against the principles of gender equality and women empowerment. And they states also establish institutions like ministerial institutions and they sensitize the public and the state machinery. If all this is being done correctly it's okay. But one thing is missing. You enact the laws, you set up the institutions, you make the people aware, but you don't let them know how to present their cases. Even when they are informed of how they have to present their cases, they don't have the means to. Because whenever their husband treats them negatively, and when they have to approach the law, the law is, is not friendly for someone who is not actually literate and who cannot be supported by a lawyer. So access to justice is, I would say, a key to achieve gender equality and women empowerment. This is actually what we are doing. I'm not telling you what has to be done. I'm telling you what we actually are doing. And this is making a difference, I would say. It may not be documented but it's something that we have in real life. The MDG goal cannot be achieved with, in the absence of access to justice. For instance, we have a number of cases, even in our, in our legal aid center, wherein women come and they complain that they have a child, but the father is not, is not in a position to admit that the child is his. So we have to battle. In one case, it took me eight months to complete a single court case of filiation. And finally, we won. But after we won, there was a problem of getting it enforced. Because the person, he's a rich person, but he has no property in that region. So we have to follow him all the way to Tigray, in the northern part of Ethiopia, some 300 kilometers away from Gondra. And there are many other cases. Even when you win your case, you don't have any means to get it enforced. So the law says that, okay, every woman has equal right to access land as a man. So it's very simple. Laws are very simple, by the way. But when we come to the practice, and when a woman goes to a court of law, she has nobody to get, I mean, to represent her. And she cannot even know the way the courtroom, I mean, the, the court operates. For instance, in one case, one of my clients, she won her case in a court of law, but she didn't know what to do of it. She was not aware of the enforcement mechanisms, and she just lost it, almost she lost it. It's with the intervention of one of our students that she finally regained her lost property. And victims of gender-based violence can hardly get a remedy unless they are backed by legal counsel. So in many other cases, in, ma in many of the cases that we are handling, they would have lost their cases had it not been for our intervention. So in the absence of access to justice, if we say that we have the laws, we have the institutions, laws and institutions need persons to move them, individuals to move them. So. This is a missing element, I would say. Major cases that we are handling, claims of maintenance, I mean, re relating to women, claims of maintenance. A woman will have a child, and then she'll be a guardian, but she has no resource by which she has to educate the child, and then earn the living of that child. So we'll claim maintenance in accordance with um, uh, regional family court. Paternity determination is another big issue. Especially this happens many times with house servants and maids. They face it almost, um, it's just like an everyday life for them. In many of the cases that we have entertained, house servants the fathers do not admit that they are actually the fathers of the child. 
So you have to battle all the way in all the in judicial declaration of paternity. And the other is labor cases. It's very easy to fire a woman employee here. But it's not a problem of the law. The law does not say so. In fact, it says women shall be protected. But in real life, they are not protected. But when, when they are not protected, there has to be someone who's, who has to speak on their behalf. In the absence of that, we can say that, okay, we have the laws, we have the institutions, and it's up to you. Sort it out by yourself. And rural land disputes, I can speak uh, about them, I mean, because we have, um, I would say, 80% of the cases in rural Ethiopia is about rural land disputes. And in most of the cases, in most of the cases, it's women who are victimized. So what has to be done? See, we are doing what we have to, and as part of a, a university. But the government has to institutionalize free legal aid services. What we are doing, I can say, is a private initiative. For instance, I'm not representing clients because I'm empowered to. I'm paying my own bills. I mean, I'll, I'll pay for the license. That license is a private license, but with that license, I represent my clients. I'm not even given an official recognition. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not begging you so that you can lobby the Ethiopian government to help me. But you see, it's not something which is institutionalized. It's not institutionalized. There has to be state-sponsored legal aid services. They say that there is one. But that's only for serious crimes. Unless you commit serious crime, you cannot be represented. And gender equality and women empowerment is not about serious crimes. It's about civil life, rather. So foreign aid agencies have to be able to support initiatives related to free legal aid services. Actually, I hate foreign aids. Seriously. I hate foreign aids. And I don't like them. But sometimes, you have to accept even something which you don't like, if it can really make a difference. You see, when I say foreign aid, I'm not talking about millions of dollars. I'll show you the amount of money that we have, we have used so far. But I'm making this point because, as Professor uh, Constantinos mentioned earlier, Ethiopia enacted a law back in 2009, SSO legislation, which crippled almost all the NGOs regarding right advocacy. This is not a trend only in Ethiopia. I think most of you are aware that it's a trend almost everywhere in Africa as a sign of um, standing against the West. Yes, if the West are not doing good, we have to stand against them. But it's not a question of we, have, we, are, we are blacks and we have to stand against the whites. It's not that kind of stereotype. It shouldn't be. So foreign aid agencies, insofar as they are working well, they have to be given the space to support legal aid services, that's my focus. And the other is law schools and professional associations have to strengthen free legal aid services. There is a lot that we can talk about, but I can send you the, the data. Here is, her name is Maui Abu, and she lost her land. And here is a student named Sisai. She's helping her. So how can you expect this person to pay for legal counsel and then fight for her land. Everybody got compensation for expropriated land. But this mother, she has no one to stand on her side. So we took her case, but unfortunately we are not successful because it was barred by a period of limitation. You see, she should have brought the case 10 years earlier. But she didn't know that, and she lost the case. So it's a lost case. And here is a case in one of the branch offices, our, one of our students, his name is Laun, helping a client. And her case is a rural land dispute. There was a land that she has been using. I mean, she inherited it from her parents. But the local government administrator he took it from her and gave it to someone else. And finally, she was having a court case, and she wins it. 
And here is another client. Her name is Fanta Balai. She's an HIV victim. And when she was, I mean, when, when, when she was caught by HIV AIDS, uh, she was seriously ill and she couldn't find a living. And what she has to do was, she mortgaged her house for just 3,000 Ethiopian birth. And she lost it. This happened before 17 years. And she, she brought her case to our office four years before today. And her case was luckily decided before a month. But her case was first decided by the first instance court, which decided against her. We appealed to the high court. It reversed the decision. We appealed to the, I mean, and they appealed, the other party, appealed to the su regional Supreme Court. And they won it. And we had to file a case to the cassation. And finally, we, will sit, we, we won it back to her. So her house, which has been evicted from, for about 17 years, she's going to get it back. So if she's not getting assistance, she can't do it by herself. And there is a victim of torture, actually, in one of the prison centers. But he's not a woman, as you all know. So changing lives without a budget. We don't need to spend millions to provide legal aid services so far. We have served more than 8,000 indigents. And the whole spending in the last three years is less than 35,000 USD. Can you imagine this? This is, a, this is the opportunity in Africa. You can make a lot by spending less. So it's not about spending a lot. But if you ask me how much money in Africa, in Ethiopia, even in Gondar, is spent for workshops talking about gender empowerment and uh, women empowerment and gender equality. I can tell you that millions are being spent. Being spent for hotel bills, being spent for... Consultants. Yes, Consultant. yes. <laughs> Consultant studies, <laughs> which <laughs> have never been, been realistic. So I'm telling you that we can really make a difference. And we really are. But in order to do that, there are just some, twi some, some improvements that we have to make. And the most important thing is just recognizing the problem. Access to justice is a very serious missing gap within the component that we have been discussing about. Thank you very much. Much, uh, Mr. Hiru, again, Frey, what? Um, you've shown us how, uh, how organizations or how institutions can talk the uh, can can talk can walk the talk not talk the talk so i really appreciate the, your institution and i would like to forward one or two questions to you um, are there other universities or other institutions in other regions uh, endorsing your practice your experience because um, it's an, it's very new to me to see um, uh, practical uh, practices that has done uh, through a little budget, as you showed us. And um, the next one is, how is the regional government uh, um, involving in your, in your um, uh, project or in, your, uh, in what you are doing? Um, thank you very much. Thank you for the great job you are doing. Just I want to ask, uh, Regarding, you know, if uh, uh, a father does not admit his son, this is, I think, a uh, case can be uh, dealt or treated in the court according to documents, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like a marriage certificate and uh, witnesses and even uh, even the land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, if, if you are owning a land, you must have some documents proof that you are owning this land, and then uh, it's easy to get it through the call. I don't know the, the, the system in your area, but I just uh, 
want to ask uh, about this point. Okay. Thank you. Uh, your university base, I, I don't know what, uh, I hope the degrees they award here are the same thing like they award in other parts of, uh, uh, yes. Uh, in the education sector, there is this discrimination against women in the certification of women. Uh, when we finish a university degree, we get a bachelor's degree. A bachelor is a masculine description. Yeah, yeah. Do you, are you thinking, are you thinking of a possibility of a spin star degree to also create some uh, recognition for, for womanhood in, uh, uh, in education? Yeah, let me respond. Let me respond. Um, the, uh, the first is Freyot's um, question. Uh, are, are there other universities working on the same area? Yes. Uh, this initiative began in 2010. And almost all law schools in Ethiopia have started this project now. But we are beginners. But in the middle of it, you see, this project was taken over by the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission because the international civil society were complaining that the, the Ethiopian government is closing the doors uh, for foreign aid and um, it's not doing something by, by itself. So the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission started an initiative, but the problem is it was just for reporting purpose, I'd say it seriously, because almost all universities have now closed their legal aid centers. It's only few universities who have sustained it with, uh, with their own budgets. And you need to have some tricks in order to make it done. Because, for instance, when I approach um, uh, the university administration in my university, I'd say that we are doing this to open legal clinics. So our students need to have clinics. OK, so in their clinic, they have to treat patients. And their patients are legal aid clients. So you have to be technical. Otherwise, if you face them right in the face, they're not <coughs> allow budgets. And how is the regional government involved? It depends. It's involved in creating problems in some cases. <laughs> yeah. It's involved in solving problems in other cases. For instance, it solves problems in none of the offices are we paying for, I mean, we're not paying for office renters because the government knows that we are giving really meaningful service. And we don't pay for computers because we'll be given for free. So. The only cost that we have is a transport cost to transport our students from campus to the legal aid center areas. So that's why it's very simple. And the other case um, is, in our case, you see, if it's a married person and if um, the wife gives birth, there is no problem. See, you can simply prove it. But the problem is, what if it's, it's in a broken family. What if someone gives birth without being in a relationship? He's not criminally convicted. But there was an affair which, which, which has resulted in a child. So in that case, you can't simply prove it. Regarding the land issue, not everybody has a title deed to the land he has. Even, even in a land that, for instance, the person I've been mentioning earlier, she has been living there for 50 years. All the years that she has been, she has been living in that land. But she's having difficulty because, you see, the big brother comes and tells you that this is no more yours. So you just have no control over that. Um, and the other is, to what extent do you use ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution? In fact, we are not legally mandate, mandated to use ADR. Yeah. But when people come complaining, for instance, when the, oftentimes it's only the woman which complains. I mean, I never faced a case where a man complains against his wife. This is the way our society is made up. Even when the man faces a challenge, I don't think he'd complain, because that would be a disgrace. <laughs> you see? <laughs> yes. Yes, that's how it's understood. So in our case, we will do ADR. For instance, when a woman comes looking for divorce, you see, asking for divorce or petitioning for divorce is the simplest thing that we can do. But it's not a solution. We'll try to mediate that. That's, that, that's a sustainable solution. 
You see, simply, if you simply write a repetition that she has to be divorced, okay, you are divorcing her as well from her life. You see, for many women, they are wives by profession. <coughs> so, you see, that's their profession. <laughs> you can't just um, get, get them div divorced from that. So, especially in, in, in the African continent where uh, the women are, I mean, are not, they can't make money. In that case, divorce is not simple. So we'll try to mediate. In fact, we will try to mediate, suggesting that if you are not willing, we are going to bring a legal action, and we are going to face such and such. So in order not to be subjected to that, may, I mean, some, it's not many, some would be willing. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kilimo from Kenya. Uh, I want to start by commenting your university for such a wonderful work. I think uh, it's one of the success stories I'm hearing in providing legal aid to um, women uh, at a tune of four dollars. If the eight eight thousand cases you've talked about, uh, my question would uh, is from the graduates that you churn out as a university, how many of them go out there to provide pro bono services uh, beyond uh, the university for sustainability into the future? Because you are saying um, most universities started it and closed, meaning that um, the sustainability aspect was not looked into. So uh, are there efforts that you're putting into uh, the graduates that you are already training on this service to go beyond and provide at least uh, minimum pro bono services. Thank you. Uh, my name is, uh, my name is uh, Yaqub Ali uh, from Sudan. Uh, good, uh, I've got uh, two questions. First of all, are the advice provided by your student to the uh, women. Uh, part of the uh, university curricula, as to say your department curriculum, are they going, uh, are they going to get a uh, mark for this uh, advice? And uh, all your students are involved or just uh, uh, some of them? And um, uh, also, are the, your student capable of providing uh, the required advice uh, if they are not capable so they it, it, it might uh, mislead uh, this uh, the, the the women uh, a third question is uh, uh, are your student uh, allowed to present or to stand uh, as a representative for uh, uh, for the women uh, in the court Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Mr. is my name. Uh, my question is uh, in terms of funding, <coughs> is it the university that funds the project or uh, individual members? or individual students that are involved that fund the project. And the second question is, um, um, does the victim pay any token to obtain the service of your group? And the third question is this. Um, have you in any, in your members, in any time receive any threat from individual or government, maybe when you win them in the court? And uh, how do you manage the security of your members? Thank you. Uh, okay. You yeah. To say okay. Uh, the first is regarding the future of our students, whether they are going to give 
pro bono service even after graduation. If you ask the Ethiopian Ministry of Justice, they'll tell you that there is a well-established pro bono service in Ethiopia where lawyers give free services. Yes, that's put in place in the laws. Even I myself am a lawyer, but there is no mechanism wherein the Ministry of Justice can check whether I'm discharging that obligation of mine. So once the students are out of campus, I don't think there is a legal way of controlling them. And the other is, is advice part of the curriculum? It depends. There are some courses which are called clinical courses. In these clinical courses, the advice is part of the curriculum. But the problem is these courses are only given for fifth-year law students in the final semester. So, and cases keep on flowing. So, most of our cases are not directed towards the curriculum, but some courses are part of the curriculum, not all courses. And are your students capable? Yes, definitely. But they have their problems. You see, it's not all the students who can give the services. It's only fourth year and fifth year law students. And when you reach fifth year or fourth year law students, you are a, prof you are a professional. And in order to somehow minimize the risk of a problem of misleading a client, which happened in few cases, uh, in that case we have instructors. Instructors, they, they are certain supervising instructors in the certain branches. But the problem is, some of the advices are instant advices, you see. Once the advices are given, it's just over. But we have to compare it with these individuals. You see, the students are by far incomparably, incomparably better than the clients themselves. And in fact, in most of the cases, I have proved that my students are better than myself. You know why? Because I have a lot of cases, and I have just a single case to handle. And they are very serious in their own cases. And one thing that we have is law students in Ethiopia, I mean, I can say generally, especially. So they are better, relatively better. So we have better students. We train them well. It's after their fourth year that they will handle that. So it's not as such a problem. Our students are allowed to stand in courts. In our region, no. But we have different regions in Ethiopia, and in, in many other regions, they are allowed. For instance, in Tigray region, a student is allowed by law to stand representing a, a, a client for free. The same somehow practiced by a directive is being implemented in Oromia. If Fakadu can help me, this, the same is being done in Jemma. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> it's more of uh, facilitating the environment. Actually, the Human Rights Commission uh, uh, usually provides them the data. So, regarding the student standing rule, there are different practices in, within, within Ethiopia. Regarding the funding, uh, you see, the, f the funding when we speak about funding in this context, it's, it's not a lot of money, as you can see. So the transport funding in our case is being covered by the university. It used to be covered by the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, but the moment they have made their reports to international human rights monitoring bodies, see, they just declined to give it anymore because the report is already sent. So this is another problem. And do you have, I mean, do the victims have to pay in order to access services? No. <coughs> Let alone to pay, it's, it's, it's totally free. And then we even support them. Yes, it's totally free. 
there is no payment. Have you faced any problems? This is not the right forum to talk about problems. <laughs> but yes, if, if I start with myself, um, I should have been promoted to assistant professorship last year because of the genuine cases, publications that I have, starting from publications in Cambridge. But I'm denied. There is no other reason. It's not for the legal aid, but someone who works in the legal aid, it means that you are standing against, against the system in many cases. For instance, I was given a final warning. By the way, now I have withdrawn from the legal aid. The main reason for my withdrawal, you can imagine. So it's a very challenging place to be at. For instance, I'm given series of warnings from the university administration for posting in Facebook. Seriously, not just for posting, but for liking what somebody has posted. I'm not talking about something which happened before, but I'm talking about something. Anyways, you'll face other things as well. And even in my journey today, I, I was facing something. But it's not, see, if you simply complain, there is nothing that you can do. I stayed as a head for three years and a half. And when I knew that the Legal Aid Center is no more a project, but a program within the university architecture, structure, I just left, because there is nothing more that I can do. Thank you.